You can go ahead and have a seat, and I'm going to encourage you uh, to grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the book of First Timothy. First Timothy chapter 6 is our text today, and if you don't have a Bible with you and you're in the room at Sweetwater, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. If you're joining us from our campus in Parker, there's a table right in the back of the room. Go back there and grab one of the Bibles and turn to page 1,180, and you'll be able to follow along with us in our text today. Now, if uh, you're in the room, whether at Sweetwater or at Parker, and you don't have a Bible, then please take one of those with you when you leave. This is our gift to you. We want you to have a Bible and read the Bible because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. And we want that to happen to everyone. Now, if you're joining us from home and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please, by all means, contact us. Either let the service hosts know or email us, and we will mail a Bible to you or deliver one to you because we want everyone to have and read God's Word because we know that's how God's going to change your life. Well, I, I just got to say this. I, I really hope that you're happy. Not like I, I hope you're happy kind of thing, right? You've all been there where somebody said, well, I hope you're happy now, and they didn't really mean that they, they want you to be happy, right? They meant that they want you to feel guilty when they say it that way, but I really do hope that you are happy because so many people today are not happy. I don't know if you've noticed that or not, but there's a shortage of happiness in this world. There's no reason for it, but the, the, that just is. And, and you may have noticed this past Thursday, we had a, a national holiday which was set aside to celebrate gratitude, Thanksgiving. So, we, you know, we had that. Maybe you got with some people. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you went out to dinner. Maybe you went to the McCulloch campus for the free dinner. Uh, but, you know, it's a national holiday that seemingly celebrates gluttony in football. <laughs> right? But we call it Thanksgiving. Uh, let's go ahead and confess a little bit since we're in church. How many of you ate too much? Okay, well, I hope you ate too much of the things that you like and not like, oh, I got to eat a little bit of everything and then, and then ate too much. I ate too much dessert, so there. It was ice cream. <laughs> I confess. And then after we pause and give thanks, we dive right into the consumeristic excess of Black Friday, right? It's just all about shopping, and they've been advertising Black Friday for a long time, and now it's like, it's not just one day anymore. Let's expand it. So, okay, let's go ahead and confess. How many of you went shopping on Black Friday? Okay, some hands went up enthusiastically. It's not quite the, the big deal it used to be. And, and some of you are sitting there smugly thinking, oh, no, I'm all about Cyber Monday. <laughs> Got my fingers warmed up. <laughs> Come on, who, who's waiting for Cyber Monday? Okay, that, more hands go up. So, uh, so we culturally celebrate gratitude, and then we immediately celebrate greed, materialism, and acquisition. Our culture is kind of bipolar, isn't it? You know, at least publicly, that's the way it is. So today, we are continuing our entrusted series by talking about contentment. Contentment, which is strangely elusive in our wealthy, spoiled, and gluttonous nation. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, we're going to walk through several parts of this chapter, but I want to begin by reading verses 6 through 8. The Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, who is his protege. He's been mentoring Timothy for a lifetime, and he's closing words in his first letter to Timothy, and he says this, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these we will be content. Godliness with contentment is great gain. In other words, Paul is saying godly contentment is a blessing. Okay, godly contentment is a blessing. And, and I hope, hope you understand that. I hope you know that. I hope you agree with that. I hope you agree with the Apostle Paul. He's saying, hey, look, if you want to be blessed, then be content and be godly. Right? That, that's kind of this, the equation for uh, being blessed. Just godliness and contentment. It's great gain. But then a lot of people go, well, what's contentment mean? What, what does it mean to be content? So I looked it up. Webster says contentment is a state of satisfaction or an ease of mind. We're all like, great, that's elusive. 
right? Because we're there for a few moments and then the kids wake up. Or we're there for a few moments and then somebody comes. Anyway, uh, see, godly contentment means then that we are satisfied in Jesus. That because of our relationship with Jesus, we have that satisfaction and therefore we also have that peace of mind because of our relationship with Christ. So godly contentment means that, that we're satisfied, we have a state of satisfaction in Jesus. Contentment is also a lack of worry, envy, jealousy, or complaint about your lot in life. Now, I could ask you to confess and say, okay, sometime in the last 72 hours, how many of you complained? But then we'd all just be confessing together. I don't know what you complained about. I complained about the wind on Thanksgiving Day because I was playing golf. And... Uh, which is not something to complain about, except I did. So there. And, and, and so we complain. We, we're not content because we're complaining or we're worrying or we're envying. Godly contentment is knowing that, hey, I'm forgiven, I'm loved, and I'm destined for eternal life. And therefore, I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to complain because I have peace with who I am and where I'm going. See, there's that tension in our lives between what we know we want and how we live our lives. Now, what does contentment not mean? Contentment doesn't mean you're not driven to succeed. It doesn't mean that you're complacent or, or have no ambition because the Apostle Paul was desperately engaged in mission. He's telling us to be, you know, content in godliness, and yet he is driven to plant churches all over the Roman Empire. He is driven to lay down his life to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ and, and to see their lives changed. He wants to accomplish the mission, and yet he says you can be content and still be driven to succeed. And then contentment never means apathy or laziness. Some people go, well, you just don't care if you're content. That's not true. Contentment doesn't mean apathy or laziness. In fact, the Apostle Paul said, if you won't work, you don't get to eat. He just confronted the whole laziness thing. He says, no, it doesn't mean that you just can stop caring about life or caring about people. Remember, he actually said that you're supposed to care more about others than you do yourself. So you don't stop caring and you don't stop trying and you don't stop working and you don't stop striving. Contentment is being satisfied in Jesus. So you are blessed if you can praise God for the life you have if you can praise God for the relationships and the people in your life, and you can praise God that you have a purpose and you're living it out. That's where contentment is found. Godly contentment is a blessing. And many of us miss out on it, and Paul tells us why. We miss out on it because money is a painful pursuit. Continue reading in verse 9. Remember, he just said, if we have food and clothing with these, we'll be content. Verse 9, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. They fall into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Now, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but uh, it's, money is not the root of all evil, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But money is a painful pursuit. Now, here's the problem that a lot of us face when it comes to contentment. And, and we're just going to go ahead and address it because the Apostle Paul addresses it. God offers us the blessings of contentment. He calls us to contentment. If we have food and clothes, that's enough. Let's just be content. But we don't believe God. In our hearts, we, we don't quite believe that he's got it all figured out. And we actually believe, we tell ourselves, that if we just had more money, then we would be happier. We'd be more content if we had more money. Right? If, if only we had more money, we wouldn't have to worry about our bills, and we'd have less stress, and we'd be content. If only we had a bigger house, we wouldn't be so crowded and we'd have less stress. If only I had a newer car, then I wouldn't have to worry about breaking down and I could get where I need to go and I could get to work and I'd have less stress in my life. And so, because we believe that, we pursue money. We stop being satisfied in Jesus. And so we pursue that which we believe will make us happy. 
we pursue that which we believe is going to meet our needs. And so we live like money is the answer to our problems. And the Apostle Paul tells us where the pursuit of money leads. Did you catch the descriptors that were in verses 9 and 10? He says you're going to fall into temptation if you pursue money. He says if you pursue money, it's going to lead to a snare. Think bear trap on your leg. In other words, you're going to lose part of yourself as you pursue money. You're going to get trapped in that. It's going to lead to senseless and harmful desires. It's going to lead to ruin and destruction. It's a root of all kinds of evil. He says people have wandered from the faith and they've pierced themselves, not the cosmetic piercings with jewelry in them, but the kind that maim and kill. You see, we fall into that temptation because instead of pursuing Jesus and the contentment that he offers, we pursue something else. And God has given us resources. We've talked about that. And yet, even though God has blessed us, we serve the idol of more. The idol of more. The false god of more. We want more. Again, we're, we're so guilty. We just, it's part of our lives, right? God gave us money. We want more money. We want to win the lottery. We want to get a raise. We want to get a better job. We want to get an inheritance. God gave us a house. We want a bigger house. We want a better house. Then we want another house so we can get out of the heat in the summer, right? Some of you are snowbirds and you're like, no, we just go back home in the summer. Leave you guys here when it's 120 degrees. Don't even know why you live here then. God gave us a car or two, and we want a newer car, a nicer car, better car. God gave us a boat. We want a bigger boat, faster boat, nicer boat, right? We just want more. And that constant desire for more, for bigger, for better, for nicer, it, it's, it demonstrates that greed is rooted in our hearts. And those of us who are in this room, those of us who are tuning in, we, you know, we don't want to be greedy, and yet greed is in our hearts. And, and Paul is calling us out because if we're not aware of it, if we're not addressing it, then it's going to keep growing in us, and we will become more and more greedy as we go, and we'll just want more and more. And by the way, this is our culture. This is what we live in. I mean, American culture is all about more. We are consumed with more. And the Apostle Paul cares for our souls. He cares for our hearts. And so he shares the antidote to more. He says, set your hope in Jesus, not wealth. Jump over to verse 17. He says, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Don't set your hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but set your hopes on God. See, set your hope on Jesus, not wealth. God gave it to you, so trust in God, not stuff. Trust in Jesus, not the stuff that Jesus gives you. Now, a lot of us love Jesus, but a lot of us love Jesus for the stuff that he gives us, you know, like eternal life and promise of heaven and new bodies and, and the things we enjoy in this world and all this stuff. And, and so we, we start fixating on the gift rather than the giver of the gift. And, and, and let's just be honest. It's easy to declare and assume that we trust God and we're hoping in Jesus. I mean, after all, we're in church. Here at Sweetwater and Parker, we're at church. Those of you who are tuning in are taking time out of your day, and you're tuning in and saying, hey, we're going to worship with our brothers and sisters in Christ right now from our homes. This is a priority, and so we're tuning in. So, okay, it's easy for us to say, hey, we trust God. I mean, we're the good people, right? That, that's the assumption that we like to make. So let's be really clear. If you're a follower of Jesus... If you believe that Jesus actually is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, okay, this is personal, it's for your sins, and he was raised from the dead 
and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then obviously you're depending on Jesus to save you in death. Okay, when you confess Jesus as Lord, you're saying, okay, you're going to forgive me of my sins. I'm not going to go to hell. I'm going to go to heaven. Okay, you're placing your trust in Jesus to save you eternally. That's awesome. Praise God. But are you trusting on Jesus while you're living? Are you trusting Jesus each day as you go about your day? Now, that's what this is about. And it's easy for us to say, yes, we're trusting Jesus. It's easy for us to pray, as in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, right? Because most of us have about three months' worth of food in our pantry and our freezer. Now, you don't want to eat it for three months. You're like, we got nothing to eat here. But you do. You have food. You can live. They locked you in your house for three months. You'd probably survive. Not the way you want, but you would. And, and some are even listening now and saying, that's great, Pastor. You preach it to them because I'm not rich, so this doesn't apply to me. Right? You heard that in verse 17, as for the rich in this present age. And so you just went, check, please. That's not me. Pastor's preaching to somebody else. I'm definitely not rich. Can I just clearly state if you're living in the United States or Canada or Western Europe right now, you are rich in this present age. You're rich in this present age. That, that, that's a fact. It's not really up for dispute. If you're born in the United States and you're alive right now, then you won the lottery of history. I mean, you didn't choose to be born in the United States. You just were born here, and you've gotten to live here, and you've gotten to grow up here, and so you've benefited from being here, and we're like the richest, freest nation in the history of the world that's ever been. Our life of luxury is beyond what kings enjoyed 100 years ago. I mean, we're just, we're privileged. But in case you're wondering if you really are rich in this present age, let me give you some numbers just so you can argue with yourself about this. The average world income, a couple of years ago, average world income is $10,000 a year. Average person in the world makes $10,000 a year. Now, the poverty threshold in the United States of America is $12,000 a year. So if you make $12,000 a year or less, then, then you're already making more than the average person in the world, and we consider you poor. And that's before you get any government assistance added to the value of that. Okay, because we know that's going to add to that. Now, the average U.S. income is $36,000 a year. It's three and a half times the average income for the world. That kind of means that the average person in the U.S. is a whole lot richer than the average person in the world. Now, again, one-third of the world, get this, lives on less than $700 a year. Not a month, but a year. Okay, the U.S. average is $3,000 a month, and they're living on $700 a year. So let me just give you uh, a couple of examples. Honduras, where we sponsored a compassion center. We've sponsored hundreds of kids through uh, Compassion International. Calvary has. You guys have. Um, the average annual wage in Honduras is $2,200 annually. That's what they're living on. That's why we're building compassion centers in Honduras. Mozambique one of the poorest countries in the world where Calvary has helped to sponsor over 60 freshwater wells. Okay, you guys have been amazingly generous and beautifully generous. Okay, we put 60 wells there. To, probably a, close to 50,000 people are drinking fresh water because of your generosity. Okay, in Mozambique, the average uh, annual income is $460 a year. So you might be the poorest person you know, but you're probably wealthier than 80% of the planet. And most of us in this room, if we're honest, are wealthier than 90% of the planet. So when the Apostle Paul says, as for the rich in this present age, can I just say he's talking to us? We need to read that and hear that and go, oh, he, this is for me. I don't feel rich in the American culture, but in this world that we live in, I am definitely, this applies to me. So, are you trusting Jesus 
in your daily life as well as your eternal life? Are, are, you, are you resting in him or are you leaning towards that pursuit of money? Because if you want that elusive contentment, you will trust Jesus and you will understand why you are blessed. Now, before we go to this last part, who's blessed in this room? Okay, every hand went up good. So this applies to you. So if you're blessed, understand that the purpose of material blessings is to enjoy and to share. To enjoy and to share. Let's look back at verse 17 and read through 19. Paul says, as for the rich in this present age, that's us, so this is writing to us. So I'm just going to change this and read it to us. Charge us not to be haughty, nor to set our hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. We are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for ourselves as a good foundation for the future, so that we may take hold of that which is truly life. You see, the purpose of the material blessings that God has given to us is to enjoy them and to share them. Now, if you're blessed, be thankful and enjoy the blessings. Okay, recognize that God has given them to you and live in gratitude. Celebrate Thanksgiving every day. Don't overeat turkey and pumpkin pie, but celebrate Thanksgiving every day. That, that's what it means. Recognize that God has given us this and, and enjoy them. In other words, it's not evil to have wealth. Paul doesn't say to you evil rich in this present age. He's just saying, hey, if, if you happen to be rich in this present age, it's not evil to have wealth. It's not a sin to make money. There are sinful ways to make money, but it's not a sin just to make money. And it's not disobedient to God to enjoy the blessings. In fact, he tells us to enjoy what he has blessed us with. Okay, so when you're able to enjoy the, the blessings that God has given you, praise God and be grateful. Now, honestly, as I tell you this, most of you are going, okay, I got this one. I, I'm actually getting something right in my life. I'm doing this well. I'm enjoying the blessings that God has given me. Great, because that's half of the reason that God has blessed you. Most of us have no problem obeying this part. It's the rest that we struggle with because God blessed us so that we can enjoy it and... Share it. Share it. Did, did you catch the whole list of things that Paul described? Do good. Be rich in good works. Be generous. Be ready to share. Now, I've already mentioned Calvary's generosity. I love Calvary's generosity. I love that we're doing gift bags for boys and girls and even some adults for the Wallapai Nation and the Crit Nation and the border uh, down in San Luis and Tijuana. I mean, we do, we do gift bags for kids all over the place. I love that generosity. I love the fact that we supported uh, over 100 kids through Angel Tree in one day. Now, if you took the tags, don't forget to fill them, you know, buy the stuff and bring it back because we got to give it to them now. Okay, but I mean, but that's the thing. I, I love our generosity. I love the fact that many of you support our community, whether it's toy drives or, or blessing the needy. I, I love the fact that you're generous in the benevolence offering, and so we're able to give away uh, gift cards, and we're able to bless people who are struggling. So I love our generosity corporately, but let's talk personal just for a moment. Does that list describe you? Do good. Be rich in good works. Be generous. Be ready to share. Is that descriptive of your life? Now, before you answer that easily, whatever your answer is going on in your mind, if it's yes, would Jesus agree with you? Would Jesus look at your bank account? and the way you use your money, and would he agree that you're being generous and being rich in good works and doing good and ready to share? Are you generous towards God? A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Robert talked about tithing. You can go back and, re and watch the message again if, if you weren't here for it. And when was the last time you made a sacrifice for Jesus? Pastor Joe talked about that last week. 
Are you blessing people who can't bless you back? And, and when you encounter a legitimate need, do you get excited to help? Or honestly, do you have that like, ah, oh, rats are asking me to give again. I hope I just have a little bit of change in my wallet, right? And, and, and you know, this, this thought that opened, you, comes into your mind when you open up your wallet, like, because you got to give something and all you have is 20s, and there's that part of you that goes, ah, oh, rats. No ones or fives. Look, the temptation is there, right? Because that love of money, that, that temptation, it leads us to that place. So here, here's the truth. You're never going to discover godly contentment apart from generosity. It, you're never going to find that godly contentment apart from engaging in wholehearted, Jesus-honoring generosity. That godliness with contentment, which is great gain, it, it happens through being a generous person. And, and this is the place where our lives get confronted because if we pursue the money because we want it, then we're selfish and it leads to destruction. Paul outlined that extensively. But if you enjoy what God has given you and you practice generosity, it, you're going to be blessed and find that contentment. And I know all the excuses. I've been in ministry for over 40 years. You know, people are like, well, things are tight right now. I, I can't afford to be generous. You know, I, I know I'm behind on my giving. I'll, I'll give later. We'll catch up. You know, oh, if I had more, I'd be generous. Here's the reality. Whatever the excuses are, if you're not generous with little, you won't be generous with much. If you're not generous with the little that God has given you, you won't be generous if God gives you a lot. Just, it won't happen. If you're not generous when you're broke and you win the lottery, you're not going to be generous. You're not. You'll find reasons. You'll come up with excuses. But if you're generous when you have nothing and God gives you more, you'll be crazy generous. That, that's just how this principle works, which is why this is not, generosity has nothing to do with how much you have. It has to do with your heart. It has to do with gratitude and the desire to bless others. And so do a heart check because generosity is not dependent on what you possess. It's dependent on a heart that's given to Jesus and satisfied in Jesus. And I know this because God tells us this. The Apostle Paul tells us this. And, and I've seen it. I've seen it in a really powerful way. Uh, I mentioned Mozambique. And a little over two years ago, I had the opportunity to travel there with a small team from Calvary. And we went and visited well sites. You know, the, I, I mentioned that we've done over 60 now. At the time, we'd done about 40. And we went and visited these places and saw the wells that you had provided for people. And we got to preach and we got to hold services, and, and over 100 people decided to follow Jesus, and that was great. And, and, and uh, we just had a great week celebrating. And the last day that we were there, uh, we gathered with about five or six churches where we had blessed them with wells. And we did a service, and, you know, they sang, we preached, we shared testimonies, we gave an invitation, people responded. And it was just like everyone else. And then they told us to sit down again. And, and they did something that... Uh, was a shocking and beautiful display of generosity. Because the people began to come and they wanted to give us an offering of gratitude. Now, when I say to us, I don't just mean to me and the small team that was there. We were representing you. They were giving it to us, to Calvary, who have given thousands, over $100,000 worth of wells that we've put in. And, and they brought the thing that subsistence farmers value the most. They brought their food. And they set it at our feet. And, and, they, and they bowed down and, and they expressed gratitude. And they were singing and praising God while they were doing this. And person after person came one at a time and laid their offerings at our feet. And, and our missionary that we work with there, John Dinah, he leaned over to me and said, whatever you do, you have to receive this. 
because he knew that in my heart I wanted to stand up and say, no, you need this more than we do. He said, you have to receive this. And can I tell you that as they brought this bit by bit, as they laid down the, I, look, I didn't even recognize most of what they called food, okay? As they laid this down at our feet, it was the most humbling moment in my life. As people who have nothing, absolutely nothing, came and gave an offering of gratitude because some people who didn't know them on the other side of the world, who live like kings compared to them, had blessed them with wells so they didn't have to walk miles to get fresh water, so that they could have clean water to drink, so their kids didn't get sick from the water that they gave them. And, and they brought their valuables and said, here, take this. And we packed up a giant bunch of food and in a truck and took it home and gave it to the pastors who were with us and blessed them and their churches. See, that's what generosity looks like when it's inspired by love for God. When gratitude fills your heart, when contentment rules your life, it has nothing to do with what you have. It has everything to do with whose you are and how satisfied in Christ you find yourself. So I witnessed gratitude. I witnessed generosity. I witnessed contentment that day. And I rejoice whenever I see it now because it's beautiful to behold. So God wants us to be content. God calls us to live grateful, generous lives. Are you grateful? Are you generous? Are you content? Because you can be. Father, we thank you because you have been generous to us. You have blessed us with life. You've blessed us with so many good things that, that we cannot even count all the blessings. And we just, we just confess that in the midst of the blessings that fill our lives, that overflow our lives, that are so abundant that it's embarrassing, God, we, we just confess our selfishness, our idolatry of more, our discontent, our complaint, our grumbling about what we have or what we don't have. And we don't want to live like that. God, we want to be people whose hearts are pure. So teach us, God, teach us to repent of our selfishness because we want to find that godly contentment that you offer to us. We want to be satisfied with the blessings that you've poured out on us. And so God, teach us to grow in generosity, no matter what we have. We ask you to teach us this because we can't do this ourselves. We need to follow the example of our Savior who gave himself for us. This is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.